Murray, and the Lord is really blessing us. And uh, some of you all have gotten a chance to come on the Thursday, every other Thursday, at the Curry Center at the University. And uh, they, the Lord is doing a great work for them over in Murray. Come on, let's say amen for them. Come on. <laughs> Sit down, because you know I'm a long way. Sit down. <laughs> now, I'm only going to leave before you a few minutes. Paul had a thorn in his flesh. Well, this, that, him, he is my thorn in his flesh. I don't know what Paul's was, but I know what mine's. <laughs> I, I, I mess with him. I kid with him. I can joke with him. He, he's better than my brothers are to me. Um, Minister Brandon, as Elder said, we met at church in Murray. He come in scared, didn't know what to think because he had never, I don't think he had ever heard the type of teaching that we are, were getting, are getting. But he kept coming back and he kept coming back and he kept coming back. And I have tried to get rid of him so many times. <laughs> but he keeps turning back. He's like, like a bad penny. He just hangs around. <laughs> That's why y'all love him so much. Um, I'm, I am joking, but um, he is truly a dedicated man of God. He is, um, you know, he's always ready to give you a word. He, he is always prayed up, and he knows his Bible. If you don't know him, if you haven't talked to him, get with him, talk with him. He is a well-versed, educated young man. I, um, I, I mean, I can say so much. I have so much fun with him. Uh, as somebody said, we went to Sky's Room yesterday, and that man going to try to make me jump, and I'm almost 60. Y'all know that. But I, I want to say so many bad things about him, but I'm only going to say good things. He is a good man. I'm just joking. All the children love him. Us older people love him. We can all identify with him. And uh, I don't know why he just went to the back and left me standing up here, but there's <laughs> nothing I can say that you all don't already know about Minister Brandon. Um, Sister Lake, you have to sing the song because uh, <laughs> he me. I'm just standing here. <laughs> um, okay. He, he is a, a, a man of, of God with computers because I had to call him a few weeks ago and I'm like, I'm being hacked, what do I do? Because I didn't have a clue. And he told me. But um, I, I'm just thankful that he's in my life. I, am, I just sit and listen to him as he explained uh, the Bible and the things that come out of his mouth. And I'm not going to say anymore. I just thank God for Minister Brandon. Y'all give him a hand. I thought she was going to preach. <laughs> you know, I was uh, I was sitting in the back, and you know, I got a heart for the youth and things like that. And I was just sitting in the back, and sometimes the Lord, he'll just kind of just drop something in me. And this has absolutely nothing to do with what I'm preaching with about today. But, uh, but I was just thinking about with the kids, you know, there's a fine balance with our children. And I think about children who have no guidance in their life, who, who are not disciplined. It's like, it's like getting in a vehicle and pushing the gas and you don't, you don't you just take your hands off the steering wheel. You know, the vehicle's going to go wherever the terrain takes it. So if we don't discipline our children, you know, whatever the world is, is put in front of them, that's the way they're going to go. But on the flip side of that, if we discipline our children too hard, it's like, it's like when you overcorrect. And so then you, you end up in a wreck. But a true experienced driver knows that you slowly adjust to the road. That's right. So with our children, we have to be, we have to slowly correct them. We have to be soft and gentle, correction and love. That's what the Bible speaks. So that we don't, you know, A, let them just go whatever way they want to, but B, we also don't, you know, cause them to, to have a wreck. And so I was just, I was just like, man, yeah. But uh, well, what I what I want to bring for y'all today. It's just something I'm really excited about. Uh, it's actually something that the Lord was speaking to me for, for a while, actually. Uh, I talked to the youth about it, and uh, and it's, it's really nothing I had prepared to preach, but 
uh, when I was praying to the Lord, and I was like, you know, what do I talk about? When Elder had asked me, uh, this is what kept coming to mind. And, and it's just, I'm, I'm really excited about this word. So I just pray, uh, I'm, I'm actually going to pray <laughs> that the Lord uh, would just bring this word out the way he gave it to me. Lord, we just thank you, God, for your word. And I just pray that you, you help me, Lord, just to slow down. <laughs> slow down. And just give this word, Lord, the way that you desire to bring to the people, Lord. And that, God, that it bring uh, a new degree of freedom, Lord. And God, that you just help us, Lord, to, to get past, Lord, the barriers that are, that are keeping us from moving forward, Lord. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, there's, there's certain stories in the Bible that, uh, that people are very familiar with. And I would think that probably most people are familiar with the story of David and Goliath. Now, the story of David and Goliath is used even in the secular world. People like to recount, you know, the David and Goliath story. They'll use it in sports. They talk about, you know, when the, anytime there's an underdog, they talk about David and Goliath. And it's, it's such a great example because you have, you know, the, the young, uh, supposedly inexperienced boy fighting the, the huge, you know, experienced fighter and him taking him down. And it's easy for people to miss the whole point of it. You know, that without God, he couldn't have done that. But as I was reading this, as I was reading this Samuel, more and more, I was just seeing that there were so many more angles to this story. It wasn't just as simple as him walking onto the battlefield, slinging the slingshot, and, and, you know, the stone just happened to hit him in the head, and oh, wow, he took him out. There was more to it. In fact, David had to fight many battles before he got to Goliath, right. both physically and spiritually. So before he arrived at the battlefield, he had, to, he had to have fought these other battles in his life. So today what I want to do is I want to go through some of those battles that David had fought. And then I'm going to tell you about the road that he had to take to get to Goliath. So the first battle that David had to fight was the road of disappointment. You see, David didn't start off with a mighty start like most people in the Bible seem to. You know, they would just kind of show up on the scene and it was like they were already doing things for God. You know, you think of like Samson, you think of Elijah, uh, you think of Jesus, you know. It, it seemed like they just kind of was already in their calling. But with David, he had a humble beginning. Yeah. And it says in 1 Samuel, chapter 16, verses 6 through 7. So it was, when they came, that he, I, I'm sorry, let me give you a little lead up to this. So what was happening here was Saul had been king. And he had, he had just messed up. He, like he, he wasn't listening to God anymore. He was doing his own thing. And, and how many of you know, when you, when you decide to do your own thing, God... God will take that anointing off of you because he can't trust you with it anymore. And so God had lifted his spirit, it said, off of Saul and was going to choose another king. So God sent Samuel to the house of Jesse. And he said, Jesse, he said to Samuel, I'm going to anoint my next king in this house. So Samuel comes to Jesse and he says, I want all your sons to line up before me. And, and we're going to pick which one the Lord is saying is going to be king. So this is where it picks up. It says, so it was when they came that he, uh, Samuel, looked at Eliab and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So see, then we see that it says, Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And then Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen me. So, so Samuel's a little confused. Because he's like, God, you, you told me to come here, but, but now you're not picking anybody. What's going on? And so Samuel says to Jesse, are all the young men here? And then, and then Jesse replies back and says, well, okay, actually there, there remains still the youngest, and he's outside keeping the sheep. And so Samuel says to Jesse, send him and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes. And what, what was so significant about that statement was Samuel placed him in a place of honor. Because that's what you did with somebody who was in an honorary position at a feast in those times. Nobody would sit down until the guest of honor arrived. And so, so even though David was marginalized, God made him essential. They couldn't even move forward until the one that was forgotten made it back into the room. And so Jesse sent and brought him in. And the Bible says that he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is the one. So David, 
you know, he knew what was going on. He had to. All his brothers are being invited to this feast for the for the prophet of the land. And he's thinking, well, man, you know, I, I gotta, I'm, I'm not here. You know, I've got to work and everybody else is going there. So he's thinking that he's, he's lost out on this. But God saw him where he was. It didn't matter where, where man had tried to put him. God was going to bring him back to where he needed to be. That was the first battle. The second battle was the battle of despair. So we fast forward. Now the, the armies of Israel and the armies of the Philistines are in a battle. Now see, God had told the Israelites they had to cleanse the land, the land that God had given them before they could possess it. And there was these, this one group of people that the Israelites fought, and they couldn't quite seem to overcome them, and that was the Philistines. Now see, Samson was supposed to do some damage to the Philistines, but he didn't walk in his calling. So there was still a group of Philistines left in the land. And now where we find them is the Philistines are on one side of the mountain, the Israelites on the other side, there's a valley in between them. And so they're drawn up in battle array. And what happens in verse 4, it says, And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath, whose height was six cubits in a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head. He was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and bronze javelins between his shoulders. Now this very staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels. And a shield bearer went before him. And then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come up to line for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves. Let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants. Now it says that the Goliath carried a spear and a javelin. A spear and a javelin is intended to be a weapon that pierces through and takes out multiple opponents at once. Because you see, when the enemy sends his, 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 his fire to you, he's not looking to just take out you. He's looking to take out the people behind you. So see, when you come to the battle, you think it's personal on you. But what you don't realize is he's not aiming at you, he's aiming through you. Because he wants to aim at the generations behind you. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So see, there was a battle going on. Now, you have to understand, God had already told Israel what the, what the conditions for their victory was. He said, trust in me. He said, the battle is not yours, it's mine. So the battle was already theirs. And if you really think about it, why would they need Goliath if they could have already beat the Israelites? That's good. This was a warring people. There was a warring nation. This is what they did for a living. So if they could have overcame the enemy, they would have already done it by now. So them being strategic, and they were very intelligent people, them being strategic, they decided to play a mental game on the Israelites. And so they moved them into a place of despair by sending out a man who was very intimidating. And so it kept the Israelites frozen in fear to where they couldn't move anymore. And so they forgot about the promises of God. And they trusted in their own strength, and they saw that they couldn't measure up to this one man. But they didn't realize that they already had everything they need for the victory. Now, just examining Goliath for a moment, it says, because I know the Bible uses some terms we're unfamiliar with, it said his height was six cubits and a span, which is roughly nine foot, six inches tall. So if I was to ask, like, Dennis, why don't you come up here for a minute, please? And Brian. Now Dennis is six foot two. I don't know what Brian is. <laughs> He's growing up. Okay, put three feet on top of Dennis. And this is about how tall David would have been because people were shorter back in those days. That would have been the comparison between these two. Okay, thank you. So six, nine foot six inches tall. Said he had a bronze helmet on his head. So he comes out wearing this garb, you know. His coat of mail, which would have looked like that right there, was 5,000 shekels of bronze. That's about 125 pounds. So this was a big boy. So take Dennis again and put about, you know, maybe 50 pounds of muscle on him. Had bronze armor on his legs. And an iron spearhead weighs 600 shekels or about 15 pounds. 
Okay, I don't know if any of you, any of you have ever lifted like, like, a, like a barbell or something like that. A barbell weighs roughly 25 pounds. Okay, if you was to take like a broom handle and then stick a 15 pound weight on the end of it, that's what this guy fought with. That's not, the, that's not that easy to just move around. That's, that's a serious weight when you put it out that far from you. So that shows the, the, the strength in his arms. He could tear a person probably apart with his sword. So this is the man that the enemy had chosen to send against the armies of Israel to intimidate them. So now David, this is what David is walking into. So the armies of Israel, they've been demoralized. They're in despair. But next comes discouragement. So David spoke to the men. He, he walks onto the battlefield because his father is sitting there. And he's saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach of Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine right. that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people, the armies of Israel, they answered him in this manner and said, so shall it be done for the man who kills him. And they were saying that his father's house will be exempt from taxes. That's all he needed to hear. <laughs> but he also was going to get to marry the daughter of Saul. And so... Now, here comes a discouragement. Because, you see, the enemy wasn't just on the other side of the battlefield. The enemy was also on the home front. And because Eliab, something rose up in him, some kind of jealousy, and he said to him, he said, why did you come down here, David? With whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and your insolence of your heart, for you've come down to see the battle. But David shut down. He said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? And so he turned from him. He turned from the voice of, of, of rejection. He turned from the voice that was trying to shut him down. And he went to somebody else and he said the same thing. And the people answered him the same way. And it says the words of David which he spoke were heard. And they were reported to Saul and he sent for him. So see, David could have been shut down when his brother was trying to talk down to him. He could have been like, oh, I'm okay. I guess you're right. And if his voice had been silenced, it would have never re -saw. His voice only re because he kept going throughout the camp. David was going to find out what was going on. David was going to find out what he could do about it. And then when, when Saul called David, David said to, the, to Saul, which was the king at the time, should have been the one on the battlefield himself. And he said, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. And Saul said to David, now Saul's got his turn. The enemy gets on Saul and says, You are not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for you are just a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. But see, this is the thing. When discouragement comes to you, you have got to stand in the Word of God. You've got to stand on your testimony, because God is always building a testimony in you, so you've got something to stand on, something to hold on to. And he said to Saul, he said, The Lord... Not myself. He didn't look at his own strength. He said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. You see, you got to look back at David's earlier life. David didn't just step onto the scene and all of a sudden be like, okay, Lord, I need your help now. David had been spending years with God. David showed dedication as a shepherd. When a, when a lion or a bear would come out and he would take, he would take a sheep, they said, the Bible said that he would have the sheep in his mouth. And David would go out. He would pull the thing's jaws open. Take the lamb out. And then it said if the, if the animal tried to rise up against him, he said he grabbed it by the beard and he would kill it. Yo, this, is a, this is a 15 year old boy. You think he did that in his own strength? He knew God was with him. He knew the Lord was with him. And so he wasn't afraid. So see, all that training God had been doing in the field, you know, his father didn't think much of it, obviously. But the Lord was, was preparing him for this moment. You see, David, all that time he spent marginalized in the fields, God was giving him the skills that he needed to step into his home. And the thing is, you're going to have to overcome discouragement to step into your destiny. Even when people whose opinions matter most to you, even when they're speaking negativity or discouragement to you, you've got to know what God says. And see, that's the problem. When we start to depend on the opinions of men to try to lift us up, when we start to depend on like our parents to be the ones that speak into us, or you know our spouses to speak into us, when we feed on that stuff too much, 
we begin to take God's voice out of the picture. Right. And so then when they speak something that's negative, it's got weight to it. But if we make God's word to be the weightiest thing in our life, the heaviest thing in our life, then it will always be powerful enough to drive us forward. No matter what anybody says to us. So now, David's overcome the battle of discouragement, but now he faces the battle of distraction. Now see, if you come to foundation class on, on Wednesday night, we had talked about distracting tactics. It says, now Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David with his armor and put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. And then David fastened his, Saul's, sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I can't walk with these, for I have not tested them. And so David took them off. Now see, this was the first distraction. See, Saul, in his, in his carnal knowledge, his natural mindset, was like, this boy's going to be all the help he can get. And so he takes his armor and tries to put it on. But see, the thing is, David, when he said, I haven't tested this, he was saying, I don't know how to walk with this. Because in all his life, David had only walked with God. Now see, if David had fell for the distraction, it would have caused his trust to come off of God and onto man. And see, the enemy will do that. He'll do that. He'll have you so ready to, the, the, God will have you ready to face a challenge. And then the moment you step onto the battlefield and you realize, the enemy will say, oh, you're right over your head now. And you, if you feed into that voice, you'll be like, oh, you're right. And you'll kind of start to look, oh, okay, okay. And you kind of panic a little bit. And you're like, okay, what do, I, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And that's when you start making rash decisions. And you, you, you let go of your faith. But see, David is starting to put the armor on, so maybe he was a little nervous. Because he knew he couldn't wear this. Maybe he was a little nervous. And so he got the armor on, and he started to walk around with it, and he realized, this isn't, this isn't me. I can't, I can't move in this. I'm restricted. And he realized that all his experience had been on the strength of God. And so he said, I, I, I can't walk with these. I've got to walk with God. I've got to walk with God. And so it says, he took it off. He took his staff in his hand, which would have been his shepherd's staff. If you come on Sunday nights, you're going to learn all about the shepherd's staff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It says, and he, choose, he chose for himself yeah. smooth stones from the brook. Ooh. And he put them in his shepherd's bag, in a pouch which he had. And then it says, he took a sling from his hand. <laughs> now, I know, I know we said we got slingshots today, you know, the little prong thing, back. That's not the kind of slingshot that David had. This is the exact kind of slingshot that David would have had. And so what a shepherd would do is they would put their stone in it. I'm not going to put the stone in it. Don't do it. It would probably fly. Um, he would put the stone in it and they would start to swing. So they would stand their ground and they would just focus. Focus. Just repetitive motion. Focus. Focus. And they would wait for the enemy to get in line. And when they knew they had a clear shot, they would release. So, so David, he had a slingshot and he was ready. And it says, now David steps out on the battlefield. And then David said to the Philistine, you come at me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And I will strike you. And I will take your head from you. And this day, I will give you. I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines. So he's talking to the armies now. I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth. That all the earth may know that there is a God of Israel. And then all this sin shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's. He brought it back. He brought it back. Because Israel had forgotten the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you into our hands. And so it was. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, he shut him up. He shut him up. But he came. He started coming forward because he's like, who's so fighting this guy? But he's thinking, he can't do anything. He's just a little kid. But it says David hastened and he ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. So keep in mind, it wasn't just David and the Philistine. It was David 
the Philistine, and the army behind him. Little David, running out to meet this nine foot tall man, surrounded by the armies of the Philistines. Now, oh, this, this is a participative moment. I, I, want you, I want to ask y'all a question. There were three weapons, three weapons that David brought to the battlefield. What were those three weapons? Slingshot, rock, rock and what? The word of God. There you go. The word of God. So see, what did David do first? He stepped out. Stepped out. Stepped out on faith. But then he spoke the word. He declared what was going to happen. What he said seemed so ridiculous at that moment. But see, that's the way it is with us. It is very rare that you're going to have somebody that when you speak what God is speaking to you, when you trust and depend on what God is telling you, that they're going to be like, that makes sense. <laughs> Most of the time, people are going to be like, uh, I don't know about that. And they might try to steer you towards something that seems more logically uh, reasonable. But when you step on the Word of God, you've got to stand fast in that. So, but the, you, the other thing you've got to remember, David didn't just do this in a rash moment. See, David, remember, David had years of preparation. And when God's preparation meets God's opportunity, because this was a God-ordained opportunity, then there is nothing that can stop your success. A God's preparation meets God's opportunity. Your success is guaranteed. Now, the thing is, when David rushed out to Goliath, this wasn't something he hadn't done before. Goliath was nothing more to David than one of those bears and lions. And he saw in his mouth, he had the pride of Israel. He held Israel in the grip of his hand. And all David saw was, i got to rescue my sheep. Oh, Because David, by this point, had already been anointed king. Remember that. But he wasn't the king yet. He still had to go through some things to make it there. But God was already using him to shepherd his people. Now, David came out. And he had a slingshot in his hand. Now something I want you to notice about the slingshot is the slingshot does not require strength. I, I'm not a very strong person, but it's, no, it's, not, it's nothing right here for me to sit here and sling this. See, the force of the stone that comes out of the slingshot is from the motion. Okay? So the motion, you've got to be consistent with God. You gotta be consistent. If I'm doing this, and, and then I let it go, it's not gonna do anything. But when I'm consistent with it, and I don't stop, it just keeps going. It just keeps going. It just keeps going. No matter what's coming at me. Now see, remember, there was lions and bears and Philistines coming at this kid when he sat there slinging the slingshot. But he didn't let it distract him. He just kept going. He just kept going. He just kept going. But then the other thing that he had to have was experience. Because, you see, the thing is, you need this and you need aim. And aim only comes from experience. So you got to have experience in God so that whenever the enemy comes to you, you got your momentum and then you got your focus. And that's all you need to let it rip. And it's going to hit its target. So the thing was, when David had that stone in there, you know, when the stone was released, everything that David had experienced in his life up to that point went with that stone. Yes, sir. All the pain that he had been through, all the struggles, people forgetting him, people living, leaving him out. Come on, man! When God's moment came for him, and he let that stone fly, all of that went with it. And so you think, you know, I've been holding all this stuff for so long. When, God, when are you going to do this? When are you going to do this? And God's just building you up. God is just charging you up. So when that moment came for David, he was like, oh, 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 oh. this is it. This is it. And he said, So now David begins to operate in the gifts the Lord has given him. Diligence. David was diligent. 
It says in verse 49, David put his hand in his bag, took out the stone, and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead. So the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on the face of the earth. Because you see, it may have just been a little stone, but it had a lot of weight behind it. And it says, so David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling of stone, and he struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Now why did David need a sword? Why did David need a sword? The Philistine was already dead. Why did he need the sword? Well, why was he going to cut the head off? Why did he want to cut the head off? Because he spoke it. He spoke it. And he knew that what he had spoken, God was going to make the way for him. But David's like, I don't have a sword. I don't have a sword. And he looked, and he saw, oh, there's a sword right there. The very sword his enemy was going to use against him. He took that sword from him, and he cut off his head. It says, therefore David ran. He stood over the Philistine. He took his sword out, drew it from his sheep, and he killed him and cut off his head. And it says, when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. So see, David wasn't willing to just stop halfway through what God wanted him to do. And see, that's something we've got to remember. We can't just step into God's plan for our life, get halfway through, and then, and then fizzle out. God will supply everything you need to bring about the fullness of His plan for your life. So if God has put a dream in you, and you know it's from God, God will supply everything you need. Even if you find yourself on the battlefield empty-handed, and you think, well, man, Lord, I don't have what I need right now. Look around you. Look around you. And especially when you begin to experience some kind of attacks and persecution. Because the very thing the enemy has sent against you, God will take it, turn it around, and use it for you. He will use it for you. So now he's operating in diligence, but now he moves into a place of deliverance. So the armies of the Philistines, they saw that the champion was there. They knew they couldn't win the battle anyway. So now the, the, the distraction has been taken out of the way, and suddenly the men of Israel, the fear is gone now. So David delivered them from their fear through his actions. And it says, Now the men of Israel and Judah rose and shouted, and they pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell along the road to Sharim, even as far as Gath and Ekron. So after Goliath was struck down, suddenly the, the, the Israelites realized, they remembered, oh, that's right. We're the, we're the people of God. So see, the victory that you have with the, over the enemy, it's not just for you. It's for, it's for those that are around you. It's for your family. It's for your children. It's for your church. It's for your co-workers. It's for your neighbors. It's for even the people you don't even know. Because the thing is, when God has won a battle in your life, and you share that with somebody else, it's going to bring them strength. Because you don't know what the enemy has put on somebody else. The enemy may have oppressed them to the point that they, they no longer could move in God. But God will send somebody in that moment. They'll be like, I've been there. I've been there. And let me tell you what God did for me. So always remember, the victory is not just for you. There are others behind you who need that. And then finally, David was able to walk into his destiny. Now, it's interesting because he still was a king. Even after this amazing battle, David went through hell. David, David became a, a heart player for, for King Saul. And, uh, and because this, when the spirit of the Lord came off of Saul, another spirit replaced him. And so Saul began to be tormented. And so when they found out about David, they had him start coming and playing a harp. And when he would play that harp, because the spirit of God was on him, that spirit on Saul would leave. But see, the thing was, the same jealousy that had plagued him earlier, it began to rest on Saul. And so Saul would try to kill David. And David spent many years running away, always hiding, not because he was afraid, but because he didn't want to kill Saul. See, the thing was, David respected Saul even when Saul didn't respect David. And see, we've got to be like that. As children of God, the Bible says, even when people persecute you, you have to love them. Even when people persecute you, you've got to help them. Because they have to see something different in you. The world retaliates. Christians do not. Christians don't rise back up. We're not supposed to. So, David was running not out of fear, but out of respect for Saul. And when David first left, he, uh, he had to run so fast that he didn't, he didn't have time to prepare again. So just like his beginning, 
whenever he was anointed king. He came in, you know, unprepared, probably stinking from the fields. But he, that's how he stepped into his calling. Now he finds himself in the same situation. And so David is, is talking to Ahimelech, which was a priest. He got some food from him. But now he says, is there not here on hand a spear or a sword? Because David's a grown man now. And he realizes, I've graduated from the slingshot. Now I need a sword. And the sword, how many of y'all know, is the word. But he said, I neither brought my sword nor my weapons with me because the king's business required haste. So he was being a little discreet. He didn't want to be like, uh, Saul's trying to kill me, so I'm running. He was like, um, the king's business to kill me required haste. <laughs> and so the priest said to him, he said, well, uh, the sword of Goliath in the back, the Philistine that you killed, and there it is, it's wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you will take it, then take it. For there is no other except that one here, one sword in that whole place. And David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. So see, the battle that David had won when he was still a child, God was still using that battle to bless David later in life. Because when David found himself once again on the battlefield, unequipped, God provided through that very battle the thing that he needed. Because when David went on, he still had to fight people. He still had to fight. But he had that, that sword of Goliath. The thing that had cut off the head of the enemy. The thing that had, had struck down uh, distractions. And, and all the other battles that David had to fight. That weapon was by his side in his latter days. And I just imagine when he laid on his bed and died. That sword was still by his side. Because it always reminded David of what God had done for him. So my question to you today is. Have you identified your Goliaths? Because see. Remember, the Goliath is not necessarily like a mountain or something that you've got you to get past. The Goliath is just a distraction. But leading up to a Goliath, there's going to be disappointments. So disappointment, has it caused you to stop believing in God's word? What about despair? Has it caused you to back down from what you knew God had told you to do? Discouragement, has it caused you to give up? Give up on dreams that he gave you? Or has distraction taken your eyes off the real battle that's before you? Because remember, Goliath was not really the battle. The Philistines were the battle. And once Goliath was taken out of the picture, there was nothing to the battle anymore. Because the battle was God's. So see, that's what the enemy is still doing to us today. He's saying, there's a battle before you, but you can't fight it because you're so distracted with this. And he's saying, if you would just take your eyes off of this and put your eyes back on the battlefield, I will win the battle for you. Because the thing was, if the Israelites had just beat the, the Philistines, the Goliath probably would have just fell with them. Because think about it, how many men really could Goliath have fought? <clears throat> and there was actually another interesting point to that. Because Goliath set these, these victory conditions. He said, if you defeat me, we'll be your servants. But if we defeat you, you'll serve us. Those were God's victory conditions. God told the Israelites, when you beat somebody, you utterly destroy them. You don't take them as slaves. Because when, when they would bring in people that were not God's people, they would mingle and mix with them. And they would bring in false religion. So the enemy had, had set battle conditions for the Israelites where the enemy was really going to win either way. Because if, if the Philistines had won, then the Israelites would have been their slaves. If the Philistines had lost, they still would have got to live and they would have mingled with the Israelites, sharing their blessings and brought them down. So it was a double-sided distraction. But remember... There's always a Goliath set up between you and your destiny. Uh -huh. That was a revelation one time God gave me. It was so amazing. He said, he said, anytime there's something I want you to step into, something that is going to take you to a higher level, there is going to be a wall of fear between you and it. Yeah. So what I've learned to see is anytime I'm afraid of something, I want to look behind it and see what's behind it. Because that's what I'm trying to get to. So when God will take that fear away from me, when I give it to him and I trust in him and know that he's going to carry me to it, then I can step into whatever it is behind that and go to another level in God. See, Goliath is not really your enemy. He's really a platform. <laughs> Goliath is a platform to you to step into your destiny. And if you can identify your Goliath, then you will have identified the doorway that God has opened to you to step into something greater in your life. If you, but the thing is, you've got to overcome the battles of disappointment, despair, discouragement, and distraction. And you've got to show diligence in your walk with God. And the Lord will use you to bring deliverance to yourself and to others as you walk towards your destiny. But here's the thing. Always remember. 
when you don't think you've got what it takes. Just look at what God has put in your hands. The very thing that you've had your hands on all this time is what you need for the battle. That's all you need for the battle. And the thing is, we really overestimate what it takes for God to accomplish something in our lives. Because the thing is, the experiences that God has given you, you might have been bitter about that. You might have despised what you've had to go through. But God would use that experience so that when it comes to the battle, all it takes is this right here. Something that doesn't have much weight in and of itself. But the experience that you throw behind it. It's going to cause it to hit his mark and sink in. It's the word of God for the people of God. <laughs>